we cannot choose to be tzaddikim. He's going to say in this chapter that to be a tzaddik is some, a gift from Hashem. If somebody tries very hard, Hashem can reward him and give him a connection to the soul of a, of a tzaddik. And that will become added on to what he or, he or she already is. But it's not so, you can't just order it in the store. A person could choose to do things that go contrary to his nature, but he's choosing to do it. It's not, it's not natural. By a tzaddik, it is natural. I hope you hear the distinction. By a tzaddik, it's natural to do good. By a benini, it's not natural. It's something he chooses with great difficulty. And continuing on page two, 210. When your heart is burning with desire to do something or to have something, and he has a tremendous longing burning to, to, to do this, to have something, a physical pleasure, some delicious food, or some delicious, some wonderful, exciting experience, beheter, and it's permissible according to the Torah, or even, heaven forbid, if it's forbidden by the Torah, and he has a strong desire to, we can have, it's quite possible that we should desire to do things that are totally forbidden. But we don't do it. But we still don't do it. Because that's what, that is the power of a benini to choose not to do something that's wrong. And that's the oath that they made you swear before you were born, born that you would not be a Russia. They said, be good, be a tzaddik. Okay, that's not, that's not up to you. You can try. You may not, it's not up to you to be able to succeed. That's a gift from Hashem. But don't be a Russia. That's up to you. That's a, a hundred percent up to you. Even if you have a burning desire to do something that's wrong. And you really want it with all your heart and soul. You know what it means to want with all your heart and soul? King David, King David had a son and he had a daughter. The daughter was very beautiful. And the son yearned for, for her. Okay. Now he had to make a choice not to do anything about it. He had to choose not to do it. And she begged him not to do anything about it. She said, we can get married because I'm from a different mother than you. And he gave in to his desires. He was what they call love sick. And he gave in and actually he, he violated her. And then afterwards he hated her. Very unhappy story. So here he's talking about someone who has such a burning desire. But the as a Benini, you can turn it, you can control it and say, no, that's not for me. I'm not going to do it. The tzaddik doesn't have the problem. Tzaddik has no problem. Tzaddik only wants to do good. Bottom of page 210. He can conquer his desire. He can turn his mind away from it and say to himself, at the top of page 211, what does he say? Gianna, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Page top of 211, first Hebrew line, first the bold lines, what does it say? Read it loud. I, I do not want to be a Russian. That's it. <laughs> you <laughs> you got to put your foot down. Yeah. <laughs> like on Purim, when they name they mention name Muhammad, you stamp your foot. I'm not going to do it. Even for one moment. 
I do not want to be nifrad, parted, heaven forbid, from Hashem Echad, Vishum Eifen. I do not want to be separated from Hashem for even for a single second. What does it mean to be separated from Hashem? That expression, we understand generally what it means. It means if you do something against Hashem, against Hashem's will, you're going to be separated from it. How do you know? How do we know anything? Rachel, how do we know anything? We only know something if it's written in our holy scriptures. If it's written in the, in the Torah or the prophets or the writings, what does it say? It says, that your sins... When you transgress, you do not, when you do the opposite of a mitzvah, it separates you from Hashem. Who said that? The prophet Isaiah, yes, Yeshayahu. It separates you from Hashem. And here's an extraordinary expression. It was taken for many, many years since the Russian Revolution. They used this expression, an iron curtain. A person's transgressions, when he goes against Hashem, it makes an, a, a, a lowers an iron curtain between him and, and Hashem. See, so it's not an expression that's made up by the Communist Party. It actually comes from thousands of years ago, from Isaiah, who says, your transgressions are alike, and I will create an iron curtain between you and Hashem. So the Benini says, not for me. I'm not going to go there. Rock on the right said, Ladavka boy, I only want with my heart, with all my heart, to cling to Hashem with my nefesh, with my ruach, with my neshama. What's my nefesh? My nefesh is my soul with which I, my actions. And my ruach is also my soul. What's the difference? My ruach is with my emotions. With my neshama, my neshama, that's my, my whole essence. And, and how am I going to cling to Hashem? I can't put my arms around him, but I can fulfill his commandments. And that's like putting on his clothes. By fulfilling his commandments, I cling to him. We had the example given, the marshal, the metaphor in chapter four. Imagine that you have a king of flesh and blood and you're close enough to the king that you could give him a hug. But are you hugging him or are you hugging your, his garments? Obviously, he's wearing clothes. He's wearing king's clothes for a, fit for a king. We don't say, oh, I had a great time today. I hugged the king's garments. I, the king is in the garments. So the, the mitzvahs of Hashem are the will of Hashem. So the will of Hashem is in the garments, is in the mitzvahs. So when you do a mitzvah, you are embracing Hashem because his will and his wisdom are in the mitzvah. And that's how you cling to Hashem. There's a video, it was just showing yesterday on the gem videos of a young man named David Stauber. He lives in Los Angeles. I know him. He's a cousin of my son-in-law who lives in Los Angeles, my daughter's husband. He's a cousin. He, at one point in his life, was turned off Yiddishkeit, totally turned off. He married a, a, a woman who was religious. She, was, she believed in God. She believed in Torah and mitzvahs. And they were on a trip once. They had a car accident. And she became crippled. She was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. His experience with Yiddishkeit was not a happy experience. 
he didn't go to a Chabad yeshiva. So Yiddishkeit was not a happy experience for him. He was just constantly being told about how serious it was if a person did a transgression. And if he asked questions, he would get a smack. I met a lot of people like that in my, my time. People who were turned off from Yiddishkeit because their teacher didn't know how to deal with them. And if you ask a question, you just got a smack as a rebellious child. And he didn't understand something that wasn't there to understand. There, was a, there are certain misconceptions. People have wrong ideas. They're from, they got the idea from their parents, from their grandparents, from their great grandparents. That's how they did things because they were all ignorant. They were traditional, but their traditions were sometimes traditions of stupidity. I'll give you an example. And he gave this example. There's a certain tradition that if you have a, a, a fleshic, a, a spoon that you use with your fleshic meal in Chavez, and you go make yourself a cup of coffee after the meal, and you want the, some milk, and you put the milk in the, in the, in the coffee, and you stir the coffee with the spoon from the fleshic milk, the Shabbos meal. Uh-oh. That spoon needs to be kashered now because it was used with meat and it was in the hot coffee with the hot milk. So it absorbs the milk and the meat together. The spoon has to be kashered. You know what people used to do? What did they used to do? Stick it in store. They would stick it in the garden with the flowers. And they thought that's going to make it okay. It's a complete misconception. Doesn't do anything, just makes it dirty. <laughs> What's the idea from? The idea is from if, a, if you're cutting, it happens to be, if you're cutting a piece of, of uh, meat that has fat on it, so the greasy fat is on the knife, and you want to use the knife for something else. You don't want the grease to get on that food. You want the knife for, a, you're gonna make a salad. You want the salad to be para. So what do you do with the knife? It says you take the knife, plunge it into the earth 10 times. And that will like scour it clean. And then you'll be able to rinse it and then rinse it off and use, you can use it. That will get the, 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 the fat and the oil off the knife. From this came the misconception that if you have a, 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 a spoon or a fork, they need to cash it, stick it in the flower pot. I used to go to a friend's house. They had a flower pot hanging over the sink where they did the dishes. And the flower pot always had knives and forks in it. They used, a friend of mine, an artist, he told me that when he, he grew up in Lithuania, they used to make jokes about the silly Hasidim that they were... They make a joke about Mashka Hasid, Mashka Hasid <clears throat> with all due respect. <laughs> he, was, he was sticking his spoons and forks in the garden, hoping that they would grow. Yeah. It's all a misconception. So this particular person is in the video, David Stauber, Stauber is his name. He says he learned, he never understood this, made no sense to him. And so, therefore, he concluded that Yiddishkeit makes no sense. And when he asked questions, he got smacked in the face. So he would had his fill of Yiddishkeit. He didn't want any more. His wife was very sick, and she wanted to get a bracha from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. They live in Los Angeles, and she wanted to come, so he brought her. He brought her. He was not interested to go to see little Baba Chereba. He didn't want anything to do with Yiddishkeit. But she was his wife. He was bringing her to the Rebbe. So they made an appointment, and he was going to go in. She, she was going to go in to see little Baba Chereba. So they said to him, you should write a letter to the Rebbe. He says, I, why should I write a letter to the Rebbe? He says, because that's the way we do things. You go into Yechidus, you give the Rebbe a letter. You ask him any questions. He says, I have no questions. I have no questions. 
And there must be some questions. You must have some questions. You have no questions at all. You never had any questions about Yiddishkeit? He said, no, I have no questions. Like, I'm sick of the whole thing. I don't want to ask any questions. I don't want any answers. So they said, well, you must have had some question in your whole life that you didn't have answered. He said, okay, okay. I'll write down a question. So he wrote down a question, which is, there was this question. What does Hashem want from us by asking us to stick our spoons in the garden? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. The Rebbe took his note, read it, and said, I don't understand your question. <laughs> he thought maybe the Rebbe had trouble with the English, so he started to say the question in Yiddish because he spoke Yiddish. I said, no, no, I understand what you're asking, but I don't understand where you're coming from. It's not for Hashem, it's for us. So what, what does that mean? Hashem has given us a path by which we can find him. If we go on this path, we will find him. This is the path of mitzvahs. If Hashem has indicated to us where to go and what to do in order to find him. And if we go on that path, we will find him. He said, it was amazing to him to hear those words. He says, I'd never thought of it that way. I never thought of Yiddishkeit like that. It was like being in a dark room and somebody turned on the lights. So that's what it's saying here about the Benini. All he wants to do is follow that path that leads him to Hashem. To do the things that are going to lead him to Hashem. To say the things that are going to lead him to Hashem. And to think the things that will put him in touch, his thoughts in touch with Hashem's thoughts. And not the opposite. And not to take any other path, which is a path of darkness. Do you follow me? Yes. It's a very wonderful powerful story. The gem video they just showed it yesterday. It's not for us. It's not for Hashem, said the Rebbe. It's not for Hashem. The laws of the Torah are not for Hashem's sake. They're for us. They are our guidelines how to discover Hashem. He continues, the bottom of page 211. John, are you still missing? Mm -hmm. Okay, bottom of page, you read the top of page 11, so good. Now read the bottom of page 211. Last paragraph. This desire. This desire to unite with God arises out of the love of God that is surely hidden in my heart, though I do not feel it. Just as this love is found in the heart of all Jews who are called lovers of your name. Name. Right. For instance, Let's assume that you didn't have an argument with your mother recently. You don't have to think about all the wonderful things your mother has done for you in order to feel love for her. It's just natural. If your mother is in danger, heaven forbid, times of war or sickness or who knows what, you're automatically deeply concerned because she's your mother. It's a natural thing. Similarly, if you have a sister or a brother that you grew up with them and you didn't have a fight with them this morning, you don't need to meditate about them to, to have a feeling of love for them. It's, it's who you are. It's natural. It's in you. So similarly, there's a, there's a love of Hashem in the heart of every single one of us. Isn't that nice to know? When I was a, a young man and I had, came to the age of going to university, I had one friend who went into, two friends went into to study philosophy. I didn't want to go near that subject because I was afraid I'm going to go into a philosophy class. I'm going to have to write essays about Hashem, about God, because that's what philosophy is all about. And I didn't know who God was. I didn't know anything about him. I had no relationship with him. 
So I didn't want to go near that course or any of those courses because I never learned Tanya. And Tanya would have told me, what do you mean you don't know who Hashem is? Every Jewish person loves Hashem like he loves his own life. Just he doesn't know it. He doesn't, you don't feel it. And you don't feel love of your parents unless they're in danger. Or unless you're separated from them because you're in a different country, or because, heaven forbid, they may pass away, then you feel great, or you miss them so much. But it's just innate, it's natural, it's hidden in your heart, it's just there. But if you think about their life, and the, the, they, they're your parents, they brought you into this world, they, they gave you life, then you do feel a great love for them. You could, but you don't need to, because it's so natural. So it continues with a very powerful statement. Rachel, can you read the next lines? Page 212, the bold lines at the top. For this reason. Even a kal shabakalim is capable of Okay, what is a kal shabakalim? The word kal means a lightheaded person. person does not take Torah seriously. So he's not, he's not careful if he does a mitzvah, he doesn't do a mitzvah. It's not, not important to him. Like some, some people call themselves, uh, I, I'm religious light. <clears throat> or I'm lightly involved in Torah and mitzvahs. I don't take it too seriously. So even a person who's light, even amongst the light, the others who are, who are light. Kal Shabbakalim. He translates it, a most unworthy Jew. Capable of sacrificing his life for the sanctity of God. Right. Here you have an example of a person who is read, he, he has no connection with Torah and mitzvahs, but if he's if push comes to shove, he will give up his life and not worship an idol. Anybody here ever go to Masada? Mm -hmm. yeah. They the whole all the people who are who are who took refuge up there in the fortress on top of the mountain, they, they committed suicide rather than surrender to the idolatrous Romans. Or a story, this is a story I've told you once so far this year, this is a second telling. Of the 1939, when Germany attacked Poland, In Ukraine recently, when Russia was bombing the cities in the, uh, the southeast of, of Ukraine. And people were running for shelter. And they ran into a, a, a subway station to avoid getting hit by a bomb. And there were thousands, more than a thousand people in the subway station. And a bomb went off near the mouth of the Subway station it made a big bang. And all the people there, a handful of them were, may have been Hasidim. Most of them were assimilated Jews, not religious Jews. But like one person, they all cried out together, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Because that's the bang brought out in them what they really were brought out in them the belief that they had in Hashem. Another example in the Torah of a similar thing is when Moshe sent the spies to figure out the best way to go into Eretz Yisrael. After they'd been in the desert, they left Egypt, they were in the desert for a year, and now came the time to go to Israel. So they wanted to send spies. That's a normal way, way to proceed. So they sent the spies and the spies came back with Lashon Hara and said, it, we're, we're not going to be able to go in. There are giants there and they're going to kill us and it's much too hard. And it, we should have just stayed in Egypt. And the Jewish people were so upset, they cried the whole night. And Hashem said, you're crying for nothing. I'll give you what to cry about. 
since you, and yeah, this teaches us a lesson, you have to be very careful what you think and what you say. Since you say it would be better for you, you think it would be better for you to stay in the mid, in the wilderness, so that's it, you're going to stay in the wilderness. And not one of you is ever in this role. Your children will go in. You were afraid that your children would get killed. Your children are not going to get killed. They're going to go into Eretz Yisrael, and you are all going to die here in the wilderness. All right, that's a very sad story. On the day that that happened, we fast every year. That's the ninth day of Av. The same day that the base of Midrash was destroyed. The first time and also the second time. All th those terrible things happened on that day. What happened the next day? The next day, a, a large group of Jewish people rose up and took their arms. They were excellent archers, you know, archers with a bow and arrow. They took their bows and arrows and they went, we're going to go into Eretz Yisrael and we are going to conquer it. And, and Moshe said, don't go, Hashem, Hashem is not going to go with you. Now it's too late. For you, it's too late. And they decided that, no, we're, we're going to go anyway. We're going to show Hashem we really want to go into Eretz Yisrael. And we, was our, we made a mistake yesterday. And they rose up and they went towards Eretz Yisrael to attack and, and fight their way in. And they were all killed. And the Alta Rebbe brings this question in the Talmud, in the Tanya. And he says, if yesterday they, they were convinced that they could not go into Eretz Yisrael, because Hashem would not protect them, what happened overnight that changed their mind? Why did they now think that they could do it? Just because Hashem gave a shout at them, he shouted and said, you don't want to go into Eretz Yisrael, so you're not going to go into Eretz Yisrael. Period, finished, end of the story. They said, no, no, we'll go, we'll go. How come all of a sudden they believed in Hashem? Yesterday they didn't, today they did. Because this belief in Hashem is rooted in the heart of every single Jew. It's just that the Yetzirah covers it over. So the, with the report of the spies, it, it was covered over. And they said, well, we can't go. And they cried the whole night. Hashem said, you're crying the whole night for nothing. I'll give you what to cry about. But that's the point. He's making here that even a Kal Shabakali, that the most lightheaded person, even amongst lightheaded people who don't take Torah seriously, they think he is a lightheaded one, not us. He's more lightheaded than all of them. And yet he will cry out Shema Yisrael when the bomb goes off, and he will say, we'll do it. And you know, a lot of these people, I, I mentioned this yesterday, that was the first time, this again, the second time, another story for the second time. A lot of these people who were not terribly observant of Torah and mitzvahs would come in the middle of the night and risk their life in the concentration camps to put on tefillin for 10 seconds, for 20 seconds. It's amazing. If the guards caught them, they would beat them to death. The cruelty, the, the horror of these was just unimaginable. You know, my wife, she should be well, is, has taken to watching all these videos that they made about the Holocaust. It, it, it bothers me a lot. It creates a, a, not, not a happy atmosphere in the house. But you see over and over again the, the self-sacrifice that people had for Torah and Mitzvahs under te terrible circumstances. And and the, the the they kept they kept faith with Hashem, no matter what. <laughs> I'll have to tell you a story. There's no time now, of a person that I met. He just passed away a few years ago, two years ago. Who put on tefillin every day in the concentration camps and helped other people to do so. He was a kid. He was like like 13, 14 years old. And he smuggled, when he went in, when they arrested him and took him in, he smuggled in a sitter, a pair of big boots, and he put in his boots a pair of thrillin. And... 
when they when they made them take off all their clothes, they put all their clothes in a big pile and they gave them these prisoners pajamas to wear. And he got all the young, he was in a, like a young people's brigade. They were gonna work them as slaves. He said of those 150 kids, only five survived. Only five out of 150. But when they were going in, so he, he became like the leader of the group and uh, he gave them uh, an order and a purposefulness and he saved their lives. So he said, I helped you now, you gotta help me. When I say the word, I want you all to start fighting like crazy. Everyone should beat up everyone else. And he said, as they passed by this pile of clothes, he said, now, and all 150 kids all started fighting. The guards didn't know what to do about it. They'd never seen anything like this. In the meantime, they were distracted and he went to the pile of clothes and he found his boots and he took out of the boots his to fill it and sitter. And that's how we had to fill in in the concentration camps. And people used to come in the middle of the night. We only put fill in on by day, but they came to put them on even at night. And there were so many people who wanted to put on the fill in that they couldn't put on the fill in and say the whole Shema. They could only say Shema Yisrael and Baruch Shem Kareem Ochusle. And then they had to give them to the next guy. So the, these were people, many of them, who never went, never said Shema, never went to Shul. Well, they said they knew Shema because they'd been taught, that they'd been to Cheder when they were kids. But the connection to Hashem is deep in the heart of every Jew. And you see, it, and it continues here on page 212. Shoshana, I, can you read English? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. Okay, so the second set of dark lines on page 212, what does it say? Read in a, your loudest big voice. Um, it is only, yeah? Yes. It is only that the, the spirit of holy has overcome. He yeah. is our Savior's saying. No man sins unless uh, overcome by, by spirit of <coughs> A spirit of folly. folly. What is folly? Folly is nonsense. Mm -hmm. a, foolish, a foolish spirit overcomes a person. And he thinks that Hashem doesn't see what he's doing. And a person would never do something wrong except that the, the Yetzirah is a spirit of folly and tells him, ah, you think Hashem's gonna notice? You think Hashem's gonna care? Go on, you can do it. That is the, the Ruach Shtus, it's called, the spirit of stupidity. No person would ever, here's a general rule, you know who taught us this rule? Rebbe Akiva. No person would ever do something wrong except that he thinks Hashem isn't looking, which is a spirit of nonsense. Go on, the dark lines again. He imagines. Uh, he imagines that uh, committing this sin uh, will not affect his Jewishness. Right. He thinks if I do this sin, it's not going to change me. I'm still a good Jew. I still believe in God. And then, he, and then he, he does what he wants. And that uh, his soul will not be served. Severed. Severed. Severed means cut off. Thereby from the God of Israel. Of Israel. He thinks it's not, <laughs> this is not going to, to cut me off from Hashem. Well, not he thinks that. The Yetzirah tells him that. And because he wants it very much, so he listens. Then afterwards, he feels very bad. He feels guilty. And he's very, very sorry he did it. And then there's only two choice, two ways he can go. Either he makes a strong decision that I'm never gonna do this again. That's a good decision. Or he says, you know what? It's not so terrible. And he does it again. And then it becomes like habit. So he says, oh yeah, I don't do that. I'm not careful about that. Some people are careful about it, I'm not. I keep kosher at home, but when I have, have to go out with the people from the office for a meal, they whatever they eat, I also eat. I'm not careful about it. He, he fools himself, the Israel fools him to think that Hashem isn't gonna mind because he keeps kosher at home and he gives charity. He sends money to Israel and he gives to the UJA. He's a good Jew. That's how the Yitzhara works. 
<coughs> it's, it's foolish. Spirit, ruach shtus, means a spirit of foolishness, stupidity. Similarly, the Kalsha Bakalim, this person who's not a religious person, he convinced himself that he can still be a Jew, that he's still Jewish, and he is still Jewish, even though he, he neglects Torah and mitzvahs. <clears throat> and he thinks that's okay. The Yetzirah tells him it's okay, even though his natural love for Hashem demands that he should keep Torah and mitzvahs. What's the reason? He forgets that hidden in his heart is a deep love of Hashem that can never, ever, ever be changed. Thank you very much. Thank See you, you tomorrow. Yeah. And then Thursday, no, no school, right? Yeah. Yes. Thursday's Arab Yontif? Do we have school Thursday? No. No. Thursday night, you're up learning all night. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if, we, you know, if I'm not going to see you tomorrow, if any of you don't come, I wish you now. Kabbalah Sator of the Simcha, the Panimius. It should be inward. Take it to heart. Inward means you take it to heart and, and, and you welcome it into you welcome the Torah into your heart. It should, it should have a place there. Amen. Amen.